It's California Edition. I'm Brad Palmer, and I'm glad you're with us. On this episode, we're going to be speaking with three administrators of education from San Luis Obispo County, but no doubt they have a statewide perspective. We'll be speaking with the County Superintendent of Schools, an elected position in San Luis Obispo, uh, Obispo County. We'll also be speaking with two members of the school board of San Luis Coastal Unified School District. All three of them will be speaking about the tax initiatives that will be on the ballot in November. One of them supports the Brown Initiative, one of them supports the Munger Initiative, and one of them supports both of the initiatives. And we'll start with Julian Crocker, uh, County Superintendent of Schools in San Luis Obispo County. Sir, thank you for joining us, Doctor. And which one are you? I'm in favor of the governor's initiative, uh, and I'm glad that uh, Ms. Munger has an initiative in terms of uh, pr providing more money for schools. It certainly recognizes our need. However, in looking at both of them, I personally will be supporting the Brown tax and initiative. And let's talk about both sure. initiatives. Governor Brown's initiative would increase sales tax by a quarter cent right. for four years, increase income taxes on the wealthy for seven years. Uh, Molly Munger's initiative, supported by the state uh, PTA, would increase income taxes on virtually everyone for 12 years, uh, a sliding scale of 0.4% to 2.2%. Uh, what convinces you that it's the Brown Initiative that should go? Well, two things. One, uh, the governor's initiative also addresses the structural deficit in the state budget. And Brad, with schools taking about 40% of the expenses of the state budget. As required by Proposition 98. Correct. It's very difficult to separate what happens in the state budget with what happens to schools. So I take the viewpoint that whatever initiative is passed, hopefully, must address the state budget uh, structural issue also, or sooner or later, schools will be impacted. The flip side, though, is that Molly Munger's initiative focuses exclusively on education, and she, she is using the metaphoric lockbox, right. saying that the $10 billion that would be raised each year must go solely to education. We're going to put it in a lockbox, as Al Gore would say. Right. So Yes, the, and of course that sounds good and we certainly like that additional money. So that's not the issue with me. The issue is again, let's say that money does come to schools, but if it doesn't address the structural deficit, we could lose an equivalent amount of money through the deficit in the state budget. So it may look good up front. But in reality, in the operation of the state budget, unless that issue is addressed, we may indeed lose money out the other door. Are you concerned with two initiatives on the ballot, both increasing taxes, that the voters of California will throw up their hands and say, I don't really know which one is which. It doesn't say Governor Brown's and Molly Munger's on, on the ballot. I'm voting no. I, I'm very concerned about that, frankly. I think most uh, people who look at elections and the politics of elections will say when you've got more than one initiative that basically deals with the same issue, uh, you split the favorable vote and it makes it very difficult for either one to pass. And as we know, if both of these are somewhat complex, many times voters, if they're faced with a very complex issue, just vote no because they don't quite understand this. When we look at San Luis Obispo County, some of the school districts, there are 10 I believe, Correct are facing minor challenges, others are really struggling. And one that is really struggling is Paso Robles, where right. you actually had been superintendent right. many years back. Right. Their struggles are so dramatic that they have announced that they will be cutting school days. This is whether or not those initiatives pass, either one of them, to the extent that over some weeks, the school week will only be three days. That's correct. I can't believe that it is the 21st century and that's what's happening. Yes, because theoretically we ought to be going the other way, frankly, because even at 180 instructional days, uh, California school year, and most uh, states in the nation are like that, are among the shortest in the right. world. So internationally, if you compare us, 180 days, uh, that's the maximum, is already below where we should be. I personally favor 200 or 220, so to go down <laughs> from 180 is going in the wrong direction. At the same time, if the initiatives don't pass, specifically the governor's, he has said that he will be forced to pull the trigger on what's known as a trigger cut. And that would result in an amount of money eliminated from the budget, which is the equivalent of three school weeks. Right. That would be 15 days. Right. So 
Wow, I mean, 15 days generally, if you're in Paso, that's another, you know, a total of what, 27 days? Right, we're down around 150 days or something like that instead of 180. So it's a very dramatic uh, reduction in instructional time. That's what's on the line. Uh, there's no way to get around that. You know, Brad, over the last five years, about $20 billion from the state's general fund has come away right. from the public that schools. That's a true statement. So uh, somewhere that has to, Show. I want to ask you about an initiative uh, that was proposed in the county by the Board of Supervisors and it dealt with truancy. Mm -hmm. And what this proposal would have done is increase truancy enforcement. Um, that proposal went down in flames. Right. And I actually was surprised by that as an observer of the process because in these difficult times I would think folks would support the increased enforcement of students in their school desks, mm -hmm. but yet somehow it died. Right. Uh, I think it was a matter of clarity, frankly. Uh, what I, I was supporting the additional countywide truancy ordinance, which would be an enforcement, and it would right. allow our school resource officers to take direct action with some students who were known truants. Um, and with good faith efforts, I think people thought that would work. However, there were some concerns that uh, targeted, some students could be targeted unintentionally. Students in home school setups, for example. And, and I've heard that, but yeah. I would presume that that an entity could issue a certificate, right. which the homeschooler could hand and say, I'm a homeschooled student. I mean, it right. just seems like that issue, which was the big one, could have been right. so easily resolved. And a proposal that really could have benefited students and families has been thrown out over a, a, a minor point in my eyes. I'm just a neutral observer, you know, I don't know much, but. Right, I think we've come to a compromise, frankly. What will happen is we will not have the local truancy ordinance. There are ways to address this legally through existing state law, and I think we're very uh, hopeful right now that in the next legislative session, some minor changes to existing state law could occur that will allow a local uh, school resource officer to enforce the truancy uh, restrictions that we in need and at the same time not run afoul of the issue of uh, unfairly targeting uh, uh, other students. So we so have to go to Sacramento to get this right, done? Correct. Well, good luck, but how's that going to happen? <laughs> I mean, well, uh, yeah, what we hope is this will be a fair, as you said, fairly non controversial issue and with the support of the local law enforcement community as well as the statewide associations. And frankly, our local homeschool group does support that approach. So we are hopeful that they would join us in that effort also. So recently, I understand that Dr. Julian Crocker, the county superintendent in San Luis Obispo County, received the Lifetime Service Award through the Association of California School Administrators. We congratulate you. I feel as if it may be a little premature because you're not leaving us <laughs> for a few years. At least I hope not. Right. Um, but reflect back over a really tr dramatic lifetime of service. Yes, and uh, very appreciative of this from uh, AXA, the Association of California School Administrators. And uh, hopefully what it does say is recognize that leadership is important, Brad, and no matter what organization, public, private, anytime you have a large or medium-sized organization, it's critical to have effective leadership. And the membership of AXA, primarily school superintendents, school principals, are just critical to educational improvement. So uh, to recognize the leadership, I think, is, is very important. Well, we congratulate you. We thank, thank you. you for your service, which is continuing for a few more years, I am <laughs> sure of it. There's not an election for, I don't know, two, three, couple four, more years, couple anyway. more years. Right. We have been speaking with Dr. Julian Crocker. He is the County Superintendent of Schools in San Luis Obispo County. When we come back, we'll be speaking with Chris Unger. He is the school board president at San Luis Coastal Unified. And then later on in the program, Mark Buckman, also a member of that school board, but he will be speaking as the president of the PTA Association in San Luis Obispo County. They are taking different positions on the tax initiative. Stay tuned for that. I'm Brad Pomerantz. We'll be right back on California Edition. Which state spends the most money per pupil? Connecticut, New Jersey, New York, or Wyoming? According to Education Week, Wyoming comes in first, followed by New Jersey, New York, Rhode Island, and Connecticut. 
Welcome back to California Edition. Our guest, Chris Unger, he is the president of the San Luis Coastal Unified School Board. And I want to speak with you about challenges at San Luis Coastal, as well as challenges generally for school districts around the state. I know at San Luis Coastal, the second largest school district in the county, facing a budget deficit of about $5 million in the upcoming school year. How are you dealing with that? Right. And we, we as a school board, were, got recommendations from the superintendent. We cut about $4.6 million out of our budget at our last meeting. And it has been quite controversial. I understand you're cutting music specialists. Uh, you are changing the way English learners receive their instruction, larger class sizes, less electives, less money for athletic travel. I mean, the list goes on and on. Right. And in a way, we've been lucky because we haven't had to make the cuts that a lot of other school districts in California had to make. But we know that we have to make those cuts now. And we know that this is just the first year of the cuts we're going to have to make. We really have a structural deficit of about $8 million. But I would have thought because San Luis Coastal is a basic aid district, which means you get your money directly from property taxes and not through the state, that you, would be, you wouldn't suffer the same maladies that other school districts are, are facing. Well, it would be nice if that were true, but there are different pieces of state funding. Of course, there's what we call the revenue limit, which is the money that every, the basic money that P schools get for their student attendance. Mm -hmm. But then there are also categorical funds. And the categorical funds are things that pay for what some people might consider extras, other people consider necessities. And those are things like school transportation, class size reduction, special education, other kinds of grants that we get. And what the state did to basic aid school districts is they said, and fairly, I think, we know that revenue limit school districts are suffering. We know that they've been cut, that there's a deficit factor. Basic aid school districts, you need to take your fair share of pain. Oh, really? And so what the state did was they said, since we can't take your tax money directly, the way we're going to make it fair is that we're going to cut your categoricals. And so, but is the, that the, appropriate? I mean, is it even legal? Well, sure, it's legal because the state, you know, the way I would they say it is the state whatever. giveth and the state taketh away. Of course. And what, what we usually find is that the state, when they're flush with money, they give us money with strings attached to it right. and say, this is how you spend money. And then, of course, when there's no money, the state says, school districts, you were responsible for making the cuts. I want to talk about an issue percolating in San Luis Obispo County, sure. and then we'll move on to Absolutely. the tax initiatives, and that deals with truancy. Mm -hmm. There had been a proposal in the county, at the county level, right. that would have imposed uh, stricter truancy laws, and there was a lot of consternation over it, and it essentially died. Yes. Kind of surprising, if you ask me. I would have thought that kind of get tough on truants mm -hmm. would have been quite popular. And, and you know what surprised me too? Uh, I, I'm certainly sympathetic to homeschool parents um, whose children may have reason to be out uh, not in school. But I think the fact is that kids that aren't in school tend to get in trouble more frequently. Could, and, and couldn't there have been some type of uh, compromise or you have a special note that says, I'm homeschooled, well, I, I'm not subject to truancy laws? You, you know, one would think that, wouldn't you? But truancy is a huge problem, and it's a big problem in our school district, and it's a problem throughout California, you know, throughout San Luis Obispo County. Right. Students that aren't in school don't make money. I, don't make money for their school right. districts. It's, right. It's not like you're paid per attendance. You're paid per attendance. So the money that a school district gets is prorated based on the attendance of their students. So there's that first piece. The second piece, of course, is that kids that aren't in school can't learn. Right. It's a little bit baffling as an observer of mm -hmm. the situation, but be that as it may, I want to now go a little broader and talk about the state. Yes. As you know, there are two tax initiatives. Mm -hmm on the ballot. Yes. Uh, one is proposed by Governor Brown, the other is proposed by a woman named Molly Munger and has been endorsed by the state PTA and in fact later in the program we'll be speaking with Mark Buckman who is a member of San Luis Coastal School Board with you but he's coming on as a representative of the county's PTA in support of the Munger Initiative. Right. The Munger Initiative and the Brown Initiative, they are at loggerheads. Mm -hmm. Have you come out in favor of one
one or the other as the president of San Luis Coastal? Well, uh, yes, as a matter of fact, I have. have. And, and, and I think it's interesting um, because I've had a chance to listen to Molly Munger and I've had a chance to listen to Governor Brown as, a, as a director of the California School Boards Association. We had both of them come to us and both of them asked the organization for their endorsement. And where did you come down? We landed on supporting both of them for wow. a good reason. The first is that in, in Governor Brown's address to us, he made it very clear that if the Munger Initiative passes and his doesn't, he's going to find a way to take the money that Munger would give to schools out of Proposition 98, so the net would be zero for schools. There's no doubt there are, all, I mean, the battles are epic mm -hmm. between those yeah. two individuals. But here's the challenge in terms of that dual endorsement. Mm -hmm. We know that if both pass, in the governor's initiative, it says his goes forward, hers doesn't. Yeah. So why did the, is it right. a statewide district board? Well, it's, it's the board of the California School Boards Association, which represents school boards in so all of the- So why did the association endorse Because we both? think, we think that, that if both pass, that, we'll, that uh, we'll see both of them enacted. At some level? Right, exactly. But, but and and we're, you know, we're not really sure how that'll play out, but-, but at, at the same time, are you concerned that with two tax initiatives on the ballot, that the voters will become increasingly confused, not really sure who's, because it's not going to say, this is Governor Brown's initiative, this is Molly Munger's initiative. They're going to get confused and vote no on both, and then well, you're really I, I would only straits. hope that that doesn't happen, and I hope that our endorsement encourages people to vote for both of them so that at least one of them will pass. Um, if Governor Brown's proposal doesn't pass, schools are in a world of hurt. We're talking about at least four hundred and forty dollars per ADA average throughout California. Well, the it, the it would be it right. would be it would be blood in the streets. Right now, Paso Robles School District, who's having some significant financial problems in North San Luis, in North Obispo, San Luis Obispo County. County, has trimmed their school year to 172 days for next year. I think they're going three days a week. Right now, they're going three days a week. I, I can't even believe I said that right. out loud, and it's yeah. true. Right, and what everybody talks about and what everybody knows is that longer school days, more days of school, are really help some things that help kids learn. The governor, has said that if this doesn't happen, we're going to expect, oh, at least I would say 10, 10 days off of schools, well, like, 180, 180 days average right now, down to well 170 or lower. I mean, as I understand it, the cut is equal to an elimination of three weeks. Yeah. yeah. And so at a time when, as it is, mm -hmm. California schools have fewer school days than, let's say, the tri state area in the Northeast it could get even smaller. Oh, it could. It, it's, it's a very frightening situation. And it's, it's a tragedy for our school kids. If kids can't be in the seats, same thing as we were talking about with truancy, if kids aren't in the seats, how are they gonna learn? I'm wondering if when we look at this scenario, the parents are just so darn frustrated that they say, I'm done. I'm gonna look at independent schools. I'm gonna look at private schools. I mean, that's what's happening in Los Angeles right. County. Yeah. That's what's happening in many large counties. Well, I'm, and, and, and that is absolutely something I'm worried about because if we don't have quality schools, if we don't have quality instruction for kids, parents aren't going to want to have their kids in school. And because of the state finance system, that means less money for schools, less quality education. It's a really frightening scenario. I also wonder, aside from the dueling tax initiatives, when we consider whether Californians have voted for statewide initiatives generally dealing with tax increases, They've only voted yes once in the last, God, 10 years, and that was in 2004. Right. They voted no in 2009. We're in the middle of tough economic times. Maybe yep. we're doing better. I, I don't know. Well, all I can say is that I hope the voters of California recognize that without one or both of those tax initiatives, that schools will really be hurt. And without Governor Brown's tax initiative, even though there'll be some small cuts to education, it there'll be a lot of other pain in okay. California. His name is Chris Unker. He is the president of the San Luis Coastal Unified School Board. When we come back, we'll be speaking with one of his colleagues, Mark Buckman, but he'll be speaking as the president of the Parent Teacher Association in San Luis. I'm Brad Palmer. So we'll be right back on California Edition. How many California high schools saw AP scores over 900 in 2011? 28, 78, 128, or 278. 
28 California high schools obtained API scores of over 900 in 2011. Welcome back to California Edition. We are now joined by Mark Buckman. He is also a member of San Luis Coastal Unified School Board, but today he is speaking as a representative of the PTA president of San Luis Obispo County. I guess exactly. it's the 24th district. And as we know, there are two initiatives on the ballot this fall that deal with increasing taxes on Californians. The governor's initiative would increase sales tax by a quarter cent for four years and increase taxes on the wealthiest for seven years. Then there is an initiative that's uh, supported by someone named Molly Munger and has been endorsed by the PTA. It's known as the Munger Initiative. And that initiative briefly would increase taxes on essentially everyone right. from 0.4% to 2.2% over 12 years. You are a supporter of that initiative. Why? There, the, for the very first reason is the money from the PTA initiative, our, our, our Children, Our Future, goes directly to the schools. It doesn't stop at jail, it doesn't need any other thing. It goes directly to the schools. I mean, that, I mean, that is a true statement. We know that the governor's initiative, the monies go for a variety of programs. Schools, absolutely one of them, but the mm. money would also go to pay for the realignment program, right. whereby lower level offenders are being sent to county jails instead of state prisons, and right. the state is giving counties to do that. So that is an absolutely true statement. And, and, and it's kind of what the governor's does is it, 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 it says we're gonna save money here, and so we're gonna be able to push money into education. So there's really no guarantee that education will get more money. What the, the guarantee is that education won't get cut anymore. I know that so. a significant chunk of the money from the governor's plan does go to pay back what was taken over the last few years pursuant True. to Proposition 98. Right. But there are some challenges with both initiatives. I want to mm -hmm. focus on uh, the challenges between the two. The Governor Brown's initiative is both progressive and regressive. Mm -hmm. It's progressive to the extent that it taxes only the wealthy in terms of the income tax. It's regressive, though, on the sales tax side yes. because it taxes everyone. On the initiative supported by the PTA, one could argue it's regressive because it taxes everyone. Hmm. Some could say that's better, let yeah. everyone share the pain, but others would argue that, you know, you l let the pain go where it can be afforded. Yeah, and, I, and I, 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 what the PTA does is if you're making $10,000 a year, you're paying $4 more a year. Yeah, it's 0.4%. It, it, it's so, it's, it's not that, you know, people, it's not going to, might hurt some people, but it's, it's very even, and everybody's chipping in to save public education. And with a sales tax, a sales tax, if, if you need something for your family, food, whatever it is, clothing, you're paying, and so you're still paying the same percent as somebody that's making a lot more money than you. The, so the, the I, I kind of prefer the... The PTA supported initiative focuses exclusively on income taxes. Yes. There's no sales tax component. There's no sales tax component, but it's a sliding scale that's very dramatic. And again, for a, a, a family that doesn't, you know, bring in a lot of income, it, it can be as low as two dollars, a dollar a day. I mean, it's less than a muffin to, to, to support it. The biggest challenge for both initiatives, they're both going to be on the ballot at the same time, yes. and there has been a lot of consternation amongst uh, the progressive wing of California because both initiatives, I think it's fair to say, come from the left of center of California, and now the left of center of California is fighting. Um, I mean, Governor Brown and the initial sponsor of the PTA-backed initiative, Molly right. Munger, mm -hmm. I mean, there are fighting words between those two camps, and there's a lot of fear that if both go down, which some believe will happen because of confusion, that the state is really in dire straits. The state would be in dire straits um, if one or the other didn't pass. What's what's happening is is there's a uh, a cooling off. The California School Boards Association, so this is the association that represents all the school boards across the state, has come out and actually endorsed both in the belief that both serve a good purpose. Although, as I understand it, the way the governor's initiative is written, if both pass, only the governors will be enforced. Are we surprised? Are we surprised? Uh, yeah, fair enough. Um, but 
what we were going to see was three initiatives competing against each other. Yes. The governors, the one initially sponsored by Molly Munger, now supported by the PTA, mm -hmm. and the California Federation of Teachers. Which is the millionaire's tax. The, right. And what happened there was the governor and the California Federation of Teachers came together and yes. blended their initiatives. Yes. Why can't the, that be done with the PTA sponsored initiative? I, I think there's a, I think the main difference is the PTA initiative is really hope for the future. It, it really focuses on the children. It really focuses on specific schools and specific school districts. For example, right now, up in Paso Robles, which is a community in North San Luis Obispo County. North San Luis Obispo County. I mean, just up the road. Mm -hmm. The students are going to school Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. They're going to school only three days a week. This initiative, the PTA initiative, would actually put $6.5 million instantly into the coffers of that school district. It is interesting because the PTA initiative really, I mean, I'll use the cliche, it places the money in a lockbox. Yes. I mean, it doesn't go through the general fund. It goes no. into a lockbox, as Al Gore would say. Yeah. And, and so locals, you can actually go on the website, ourchildrenourfuture2012.com, and there's a calculator. And you can put your district, you can put your school, and see exactly how much money is going to be coming to your community. If we look at public polling right now, and look, polls are all over the place, yep. it's early. What it appears is the governor's initiative is getting the support of more than 50% mm -hmm. of Californians. The PTA support initiative is not, which is interesting. Um, I'm wondering if it's because of the relative popularity of Jerry Brown, and I do say relative, mm -hmm. or what, what do you think that is? I mean, it, it's amazing to me that, that, that people are engaged enough to know the difference. And I think as we look at polls, there's the surface part of the right. poll, and that's the initial question and the initial answer. When the public is given the explanation of the difference between the two, the, the PTA initiative starts coming way up. And so we're not seeing that second level of polling. It's interesting you mentioned that. The latest poll that I've seen was from USC LA Times. Mm -hmm. And the initial question, the initiative came in, I think, at 59% support. Right. When they went deeper, the support started to drop. So it's exactly what you described. So we're seeing one. Um, we know that California voters have not passed a statewide tax increase since 2004. Right. In 2009, Governor Schwarzenegger, former Governor Schwarzenegger, uh, supported one that went down in flames. Right. Different time. Right. Uh, not a very popular governor. This governor is arguably more popular. I mean, polls indicate he is. Right. Um, do you think the state is ready to pass a statewide tax initiative, be it the governor's or the one supported by the PTA? I think the state, I think the parents, I think the grandparents, I think the people of California are, have seen the devastation on public schools and are ready to support public schools. I, I, I honestly believe we will see them pass. Do you feel, though, that when we look at the governor's initiative, what you see as a hit in that its money is spent more broadly may be seen as a plus? because we do know that our prisons are in dire shape. We're under a federal court, a you know, Supreme Court order to release prisoners. We're under a health care mm -hmm. uh, receivership in our prisons. I mean, could it be that that blended approach is the appropriate one? It, it, the effect that it has on public education and calling it an education initiative as opposed to the, the PTA initiative is very interesting because we're not hearing about that other stuff as uh, most, I mean, you're very well. I try. And you're very well informed. I, you can fool most of the people most of the time. No, but not Brad. Well, there you have it. No, but, I'm the one who's being fooled, but be that as it may. But, but what we're really doing is seeing a lot of money from uh, the governor's initiative going into these different programs. And so what it sort of is a promise that we're not going to cut public education anymore, that we're going to bring it back up to some level of this bizarre right. thing called Prop 98. But we've lost $24 billion over the last four years in public education. That's the governor's initiative, and not to, you know, we're not fighting with them anymore. That we both really? understand. No, no, it's, it's truce time. We both, they're okay. both there. The, the, the PTA initiative puts money directly into our neighborhood. Mark Buckman, I want to thank you so much for joining us. He is the president of the PTA in San Luis Obispo County. He also happens to be a member of the San Luis Coastal Unified School Board. I'm Brad Palmer. Thank you so much for watching California Edition.